you, Debbie. <coughs> Good evening. So, when Joanna and I heard we were both to give our professorial lectures this term, we decided, independently and immediately, even if with some trepidation, that we would like to introduce each other. It seemed inevitable and appropriate for many different reasons. I am unsure, however, if I have the upper hand in speaking first or if she has a respondent's advantage in going after me. It remains to be seen. So, Joanna is a dear friend. And that friendship has sprung from, grown, and blossomed through our entwined professional lives. She was on the panel that appointed me here at the court hall over 20 years ago. And since then, we have taught courses and supervised students together, read each other's work, sat side by side at conferences, and in far too many meetings. <laughs> we have edited books together, even creating indexes in tandem. For trading artist materials, a gargantuan task. She worked backwards from Z, and I worked forwards from A. <laughs> we met at P. It tells you something about who worked faster. <laughs> Having overlapped at Pisa, for which we both compiled intriguingly and revealingly different entries. <laughs> Joanna and I have shared our scholarly obsessions, along with random items of food pulled from our handbags at moments of need, <laughs> hotel rooms, and now an office. Most memorably, and importantly for both of us, I think, we have looked long and hard at objects together, often in the treasured company of many of you here this evening. From Lubeck to Berlin, Madrid to Milan, Avignon to Siena, poring over the backs of paintings, peering underneath, scrutinizing hinges or fixings for evidence of construction, display, and use in the best court hall tradition. At least we think of this as a court hall tradition, but I wonder if its origin, in fact, lies with Joanna. <laughs> that would not surprise me. Joanna's influence on the court hall and the field more widely runs deep. She has been the most generous of mentors, the kindest of colleagues, guiding and encouraging, commiserating and teasing, sharing her wide knowledge and often wittily delivered wisdom. She has taught, not just me, a great deal about writing and teaching, about looking, about professionalism, and about what art history is and what it can do. I owe a great deal of my intellectual formation to her, the better part, I would add, and I imagine this debt is one I share with many. So, how to introduce a professor like Joanna? Her publications are dazzling and fundamental, of course. Her beautiful and beautifully written book on the Dominicans is a model of scholarship that encapsulates her 30-odd years of teaching as well as, as well as research in a manner that is typically generous and accessible. She has told us more about the Virgin's foot than we ever thought we might need to know. <laughs> and in doing so, change the way we now approach any medieval image of the Virgin and Child. But rather than list more of these sparkling achievements, I thought I might instead, justifiably, borrow an old trick that I have learned from Joanna herself. And she has, therefore, I'm afraid, only herself to blame. <laughs> in such situations, if in doubt, fall back on the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> So, there I turned for the definition of canon. <laughs> Clearly, the OED's first offering, a large, heavy piece of artillery, um, formerly used in warfare, was no good at all to me. So I tried a variant spelling, putting academic integrity aside, which produced something far more useful. Canon, a fundamental principle or aphorism governing the systematic or scientific treatment of a subject a standard of judgment or authority, a general rule, a test, criterion, and means of discrimination. That was much more like it, and led me to ask, what are the fundamental principles or rules that govern Joanna's canon? I have whittled them down to three, all happily beginning with C. These, the first of these, I think, must be collaboration. Joanna's canon certainly maintains that all academic enterprises are more fruitful and more fun when undertaken with others. 
Indeed, one of her most important means of discrimination for any given situation or person is based on potential for collaboration. The structure she has created over the years to instill and encourage this important aspect of her canon are many. I need only point to Giotto's circle, the Master of the Fog Pietà project, or her founding of the Medieval Work in Progress Seminar and the annual Medieval Postgraduate Conference, not to mention the collaborative spirit she has long nurtured in the medieval section and its students. The second tenet of Canon's Canon is close looking. Anyone who has spent any time in front of objects with Joanna will recognise that this is a deeply held belief, indeed a test of sorts. How closely one looks and for how long is, one suspects, a criterion for Joanna's approval. With Joanna, however, this close looking is never myopic. What she observes from the detail always translates into a bigger picture. Joanna pays close attention to people as well as paintings and to the ideas that shape them. Her close looking is not just the focused attention on hinges and carpentry that I mentioned above, love that as I do, but it's a principle she applies more widely. This is undoubtedly at the heart of Joanna's canon. This leads me to the third and final C, creativity. Joanna can put things, people and places together in imaginative ways, seeing connections and making links between objects and ideas, spaces and time, institutions and individuals. Creativity governs her teaching and supervising too and is a large part of the reason she has been so successful in populating the field with such impressive international and influential students over the last three decades. This then is Joanna's canon. And yet, let us return to the OED because the first definition I found was not so far off the mark after all. <laughs> because what is abundantly clear from all of this is that tonight we are actually dealing with the heavy artillery. <laughs> this is a big gun of art history. But unlike the big guns of medieval Europe, it is anything but cumbersome. It is agile, it is deft, it is accurate. It commands the field with quiet assurance rather than blustering power. It is, therefore, my pleasure and privilege to introduce our greatest canon to deliver him in her inaugural <laughs> professorial lecture, engaging with Sienese painting through time. Please join me in welcoming Professor Joanna Cannon. Susie, thank you so much, and you have set the bar impossibly high. It's going to take me a fortnight just to think what I might be saying. Am I audible at the back? It seems a very long way away. Yeah. Audible? Yeah. Good, thank you. This lecture has three main sections and some words of introduction. The theme of engagement through time will be approached in several ways. First, retrospection. Some thoughts on my engagement with Sienese painting as student and as teacher over the last 50 years. Next, some observations on the ways in which Sienese painters used time as a device for engaging their 14th century viewers. And last, anticipation, considered both as a sensation experienced by 14th century viewers and very briefly in the sense of my own anticipation of the exhibition of Sienese art in whose planning I'm involved. Originally, the section on retrospection was intended to be brief, but the time to start thinking in earnest about this lecture coincided with clearing out the office at Somerset House. Within days of the jolly publicity shot for the lecture invitation being taken against a background of treasured teaching books, the disruption of packing up had begun. As I went through as many files as there was time for, trying to reduce the piles of boxes, books and papers destined for Vernon Square or for home, I was ambushed by the past. Old photos, course plans and teaching notes, perhaps to be kept, jostled with boring meeting minutes, certainly to be discarded, <laughs> and memos on blue paper written in the long familiar handwriting of former colleagues, definitely to be treasured. What historian could resist so much rich source material? 
And so, retrospection will take up more time this evening than initially intended. But anticipation still has an important part to play in these remarks. There's always something liberating about a clean slate and fresh start, and thinking about what it might bring. And Vernon Square is already starting to feel like home, all the more so as familiar faces frequent it as this evening. So, to begin at the beginning, it's late July 1969. Man has just walked on the moon, <laughs> and I have recently left school. Although you can't see it, I'm sitting on my suitcase outside my parents' house, about to be driven to the airport for my flight to Italy. I'm to spend a month in Florence, taking an Italian course, in preparation for starting at the Courtauld in October. I had a great time there. And one of my favourite things was the Annunciation by Simone Martini in the second room at the Uffizi. My engagement with Sienese painting had begun. And more about this particular painting later. At the Courtauld, we got a photograph of the handwritten lecture timetable. But it wasn't until the start of the spring term that we reached the 13th and 14th century Italy with a lecture by Julian Gardner on Tuscan art that surely included Simone Martini. To be honest, I can't remember, but I do recall that the slides were wonderful. <laughs> Another lecture that made a big impression that term was the one by Michael Baxendall in the Tuesday evening public lecture series, in which he compared the different stages of the Virgin's response to the Annunciation as seen in paintings with those found in sermons and other religious texts. This must have been a sketch for section two of Painting and Experience, published two years later. In the BA second year and first term of the third year, each student studied a special period. Having initially considered the 17th century, my choice eventually came down to either the 15th century or the Gothic, circa 1200 to 1350. I remember very clearly discussing this with Dr. Gardner, as he then was. He recommended that I consider taking the 13th, 14th century option, skillfully suggesting that despite my trepidation, I would benefit a great deal from a whole term of Gothic architecture with Peter Kitson. And today in particular, many of us remember PK with great fondness and gratitude. Knowing absolutely nothing about the Middle Ages beyond what I'd gleaned from the survey lectures and Christopher Hola's topic on Westminster Abbey, I decided to take my courage in both hands and seize the chance to immerse myself in something completely new for four terms of my university course. It was a decision that I've never regretted. I did indeed learn an enormous amount from PK. And the term studying Duecento and Trecento art with Julian was a delight. I'm so pleased that Julian is here this evening to hear me repeat my thanks. For the last component of the BA, the special option, I chose a new course, Art in Rome 300 to 1300, jointly taught by Julian and Robin Cormack. This was an excellent course, underpinning my enthusiasm for the long Middle Ages in Italy and connections with Byzantium. It was made even more stimulating by the preparatory trip to Rome that I made with my fellow student on the course, Virginia Glenn. There were just the two of us, and together with Nick Hall, just the three of us, on the Gothic course. I was very sorry to hear only a few weeks ago that Virginia had died. She was a larger-than-life character. The next few years were spent working on my doctorate. You can see I was pretty hungry by this time. <laughs> the next few years were spent working on my doctorate, supervised by Julian Gardner, and living as much as possible in Italy. And that's uh, Vicolo del Cinque, where I did actually live. I was principally based in Rome, but my thesis on the Dominicans dealt with 26 different central Italian towns and included a chapter on paintings by Sienese artists. When my funding ran out, I returned to London and started work in the Conway Library and in the Garrison Collection with some Courtauld teaching as well. Eventually, I completed my doctorate and then formalised my scholarly engagement with Sienese art 
by publishing my material on Simone Martini, the Dominicans, and the early Sionese polyptic in the Journal of the Warburg and Courtauld Institutes. Around the same time, I entered into an engagement of a different kind, <laughs> one that over the course of time has ensured stern editorial oversight, <laughs> an in-house photographer, an exemplar of how to teach, not always followed, I'm afraid, a house filled with books on Byzantium, on medieval manuscripts, and latterly on ivories, the perfect guide to the, these works, and many opportunities for travel to engage with art at first hand, including plenty of close looking. <laughs> Meanwhile, my teaching at the Courtauld had become sufficiently regularized for me to be able to propose a third year BA option with a view to turning it in due course into an MA special subject. With Julian Gardner's elevation to the chair at Warwick, there was the possibility of taking over his MA course on Giotto and Florentine painting. But I decided to take a different route. Sienese painting was relatively unexplored. The bibliography compared with that on Giotto was tiny. And thanks to the works of Milanese and of Pelio Bacci, important contemporary documentation was accessible to those prepared to tackle Latin and some of it also available in translation. I wanted to design a course that encouraged the students as much as possible to engage directly with, an, with analysis of the form and the condition of the works themselves in conjunction with the documentation that was contemporary to them. Sienese painting provided the perfect material. Moreover, two monographs on Duccio had just appeared, those by John White and James Stubblebine, providing not only a helpful framework in English, but also such different interpretations of the same artist that points of debate, essay topics, and exam questions were easily to hand. And, as you can perhaps see in the course timetable, the art of Siena invited a stimulating range of comparisons with works from other countries and cultures. Here's the exam paper that the first group of BA students had to face. It's a pleasure to know that one of them, Tanya Adams, Tanya Jones as was, is here this evening. This paper and the many others that I came across while tidying my office provide a fascinating snapshot of what has changed in my field and what has remained the same. Which questions have now, now been answered? Which ones would be answered very differently now? And which ones one would no longer dream of asking? Plenty of material here for another lecture one day. Since I first taught a course on Sienese art, the bibliography has enlarged substantially. There have been important, ex important exhibitions and discoveries, <coughs> invaluable general studies, notably those by Hayden McGuinness and Diana Norman, and reassessments of the significance of Siena vis-à-vis -vis other centers of Trecento art. My MA course has changed over the years, moving at one point towards a focus on Assisi and the mendicant orders, and more recently to the theme of seeing Sienese art, encompassing broader questions of vision and visuality as applied to art in a variety of media. I won't attempt to summarize all these changes here, but I thought it might be interesting briefly to consider some of the different ways in which students on my courses would have engaged with one particular painting over the last 40 years. I've chosen Simone Martini and Lippo Memmi's Annunciation for this whistle-stop tour. Although this is not a painting on which I've ever published, it seemed the obvious choice as my own first point of engagement with Sienese art. Moreover, both the painting and subsequently its museum setting have been refreshed and restored in the present century. The changing condition of Sienese works has been a topic of particular importance in the last half century. When I first fell for the painting, I had no idea that the framing was not original. It dates from 1894. In the intervening years, we've become far more aware, since I first saw the painting, we've, be I, we've become far more aware of the extent of reframing of works of this period. In the attempt to reinstate the original condition of the work of art, Later frames have sometimes been stripped away, although not in this case, and only more recently has the whole physical work, history of the work of art, including a sympathetic engagement with post-medieval interventions, 
become a more popular field of inquiry. Had I consulted Luisa Marcucci's extremely thorough and judicious permanent collection catalogue entry for the painting, prepared in the early 1960s, I would immediately have discovered that the frame was not original. I would also have discovered that the condition of the painting was not of the best, with considerable retouching. I would have learnt about what could be deduced from the published documentation associated with the work and about the peregrinations of the painting after it left the Duomo of Siena. The inscription on the base of the frame, although wrongly reassembled, states that the work was painted by two artists, Simone Martini and Lippo Memmi of Siena in 1333. Marcucci's catalogue entry assesses the Fortuna Critica of the painting at some length, summarising a range of different opinions as to the relative contributions of the two artists. Marcucci also provides a sympathetic visual analysis of the work, of its place within Simone's development, and its relation to contemporary and near-contemporary works. By the time I started to encourage students to engage with this material, other issues had come to the fore. It's hard now to recall that there was ever a time when we were unaware that Simone and Lippo's Annunciation, made for the altar of Sant'Ansano in the Duomo of Siena, came to form part of a programme with three other works, Pietro Lorenzetti's Birth of the Virgin, Ambrogio Lorenzetti's Purification of the Virgin, and Bartolomeo Bulgarini's Nativity. The design and locations of these altarpieces and their altars, and the competition between them, first discussed by Caven Frederick and by Henk von Oss, and subsequently refined through other research, has now become a staple of any course or lecture on Sienese art. A student studying this Annunciation will be well aware of its original setting and its place as part of a larger scheme. In 1969, as I was admiring the Annunciation in a very uninformed way, Henk van Oss published a book that addressed the experience of praying before this painting and re reciting the words of the Ave inscribed on its surface. This line of approach was to prove extremely rich but since Van Oss's Marius Demut und Verherrlichung in der Sienesischen Malerei was written in German, most students could only benefit from its very stimulating ideas at second hand. Van Oss's two-volume work on Sienese altarpieces, written in English and published in 1984 and 1990, made some of these ideas on the art of devotion more available to English-speaking students. Attrib attributional debate and assertion, the mainstay of earlier scholarship on this work, broadened out into more profitable discussion of how collaboration might have functioned within the workshop. Putting together, on the one hand, the evidence of inscription and documents, and, on the other, the different ways in which tasks could be divided between design and execution, and among different layers of the same area of a painting, together with growing awareness of group styles, as at Assisi, all spurred students to think through the issues. Our treatment of date, that other mainstay of the caption and the museum label, has also been nuanced over the years. The inscription says 1333, but this is clearly the date of completion and installation, not necessarily of design and execution. Payment documents show that work on the structure of the altarpiece was underway earlier in the 1330s, possibly as early as 1329. Stepping very close to the picture surface, Moimir Frinter, Erling Skaug and Joseph Poltzer recorded and analysed punch decoration, seeking new methods of approaching the functioning of the workshop through its distinctive tools, while Norman Muller looked carefully at the sgraffito work. Stepping a little further back, Paul Hills contemplated and captured the play of light within the picture and upon the picture surface. Uneven rays of light emanating from the halos have also been discussed in connection with medieval theories of light and vision. The remarkable textiles evoked in Gabriel's garments were studied in a very profitable way by Lisa Monas, who showed the close connection between the pattern on the angel's tunic and a rare surviving example of imported tartar silk in the vestments reputedly of Pope Benedict XI, kept in San Domenico in Perugia. 
Simone and Lippo's altarpiece now has a major role to play in broader studies of 14th and 15th century paintings of the Annunciation. The many echoes of this work have been traced in and around Siena, and also notably in the work of Fra Angelico. Daniel Arras inserted the painting into his study of the Italian Annunciation within a history of perspective, and the theological and meditative import of its marbled pavement have been discussed by Georges de Dubermann. A monograph edited by Alessandro Cecchi was devoted to the painting in 2001, following extensive cleaning and conservation. X-radiographs and infrared reflectograms contributed to our understanding of the physical nature and the planning of the work, and Monica Butzek provided a thorough revisiting of the documentation based on the researches of the Kirchen von Siena project. Importantly, the book provided magnificent photographs, far beyond what any student could have expected before the late 20th century. One intriguing illustration reconstructs the area of the central panel that was gilded before painting commenced. This brings home forcefully to the student the degree of planning that was required before the artists picked up their paintbrushes. This also confirms the skill, forethought and sheer cleverness of the lily vase and this picture really doesn't do it justice. This complex polygonal form with handles turned at an angle to the picture plane stands convincingly on the shallow marble stage and yet it is conjured up by nothing more than a thin application of unmodulated brown paint, a thorough understanding of foreshortening and, as Erling Skaug has pointed out, a selection of simple punches of different sizes used to express the varied fall of light on curved surfaces. A student coming to the study of Trecento painting with preconceived ideas about how to apply the words realistic or lifelike to what they see just needs to be placed in front of this vase in order to start thinking about the complexities inherent in implying such terms to Simone's work. Encouraging students to think about what they might mean by the term realistic or its cognates was even more stimulating when, as the Sala dei Primitivi in the Uffizi were undergoing restoration a year or two ago, the Annunciation and Ambrogio Lorenzetti's Purification of the Virgin, which usually occupied different walls in the same room, were temporarily exhibited side by side. Ambrogio's architectural setting with its perspectival construction based on a central vanishing axis, is always seen as a major step on the road to single point perspective and towards everything that this is thought to imply for the engagement of the viewer in relation to the space and therefore also to the world of the picture. But the Annunciation offers the viewer many points of engagement too. Not only the invitation to speak the words on the picture surface or the fascination of the illusory vase, but also the velocity and timing of Gabriel's approach. An Annunciate Angel's flowing robes had long been used to imply speed in representations of the Annunciation, but the combination of the upraised wings, the upwards flick of the mantle, and the Virgin's fearful withdrawal, joined to convince the viewer that Gabriel has just, at this very moment, arrived. It's this precision in the handling of time that I wish, wish to pursue in the next part of my lecture, and which I would argue is a powerful visual tool that deserves to be ranked beside the rebirth of pictorial space as a means of engaging the viewer. The narrative cycle on the rear of Duccio's Maya Star for the high altar of Siena Cathedral provides a densely detailed account of Christ's passion but does not prioritise the clear sequence of scenes. Time is an element in Duccio's methods of storytelling, but place and clusters of different events are more important tools here. Nevertheless, we can see some instances in which Duccio uses a temporal device with precision, the most notable of which is simultaneity. As is well known, the two scenes immediately to the right of the central axis of, of agony in the garden and betrayal are joined. At the very moment when Christ is brought before Annas in an upper room, Peter, seated directly below, denies knowing him, the first of the three denials. The architectural framing confirms the connection 
with the staircase binding together the simultaneous events. The dramatic force of this simultaneity is also used, less overtly, in the corresponding pair of scenes immediately to the left of the central axis. In the upper scene, Judas makes his pact with the priests to betray Christ and receives his 30 silver coins shown tumbling from the priest's hand into that of Judas. In the lower scene, Christ delivers his last sermon to the apostles. The viewer observing this painting for long enough and with sufficient attention to count the number of apostles will soon realise that unlike the two previous scenes, Last Supper and Christ washing the feet of the apostles, there are only 11 of them. In the washing of the feet, Judas is present, but his, head, or his turned head already isolates him from the rest of the group. At the Last Supper, Judas is conspicuous as Christ hands him the sop. In St John's account, Christ says to Judas, that which thou doest, do quickly. And Judas, having received the sop, goes out immediately. In the time between the Last Supper and the next pair of scenes, Judas has left to fulfill Christ's prediction. Just as Christ is giving his last sermon to his true followers, Judas confirms his falsity. Another device used by Duccio in the Maestà is that of continuous narrative. This method, in use at least since early Christian times, was particularly useful for depicting miracles of healing. The healing of the man born blind, for example, shows the malady and the cure in a single setting. The temporal sequence can be easily grasped by the viewer. This technique was well understood by the following generation of Sionese painters, who developed great skills in hagiographical narrative. A device used for biblical miracles could also be employed when telling the story of a much more recent figure, sometimes a person whose activities fell within living memory. For example, the panel painting of Beato Agostino Novello, now in the Pinacoteca in Siena, originally formed part of Agostino's tomb in the church of the Augustinian Hermit Friars in Siena. Agostino died in 1309, and this painting, universally attributed to Simone Martini, was executed by 1329, possibly as early as 1324, within 20 years or less of the holy man's death. The four scenes flanking the central figure each show one of Agostino's posthumous miracles performed in or around Siena at some time after 1309. The healing of the child savaged by a dog, evidently an exceedingly bad dog, is explained by repeating and the figures in a continuous narrative. As in Duccio's healing of the man born blind, the viewer is presented with a clear before and after, although the exact passage of time between the two states is not defined. A more complex before and after is provided by the miraculous escape from harm of a boy who fell from the balcony of a Sienese house. There are multiple centres of interest to engage the viewer. The child hurtles towards the ground, arms outstretched. The Beato, the saint, is evidently there to save him, making a gesture of blessing with his right hand and holding up with his left the plank of wood that has come loose from the wooden balcony above, allowing the child to fall through the gap. Equally evidently, the saint's intercession has been successful. Two men support the second figure of the child, safe and sound. But what happened between these two points in time? The depiction of a falling figure inevitably draws the viewer in. Gravity dictates the certainty of the outcome. It's hard not to wince when looking at the figure of the falling boy. Our reactions are reinforced by the open-mouthed distress of the mother leaning out from the balcony and the man caught in two moments, looking at the falling boy while supporting the saved one. One would guess that, that in the crucial missing part of the story, the saint stopped the boy's fall or swiftly healed him with a gesture as he lay injured on the ground. But surprisingly, the story may have been a little different. A corresponding miracle text survives and relates that the true danger was that the boy would be hurt by the heavy plank falling on top of him. 
What Agostino Novello did was to cause the plank to hover miraculously in midair for some time, allowing the boy to escape. The precise rendering of this complex series of events was beyond even Simone's talents as a storyteller, but it was well within his compass to create an image that engaged the viewers and drew them in and can still draw us in, not only to the two points in time that are represented, but also to the moments in between them. Most specific, and in my view most successful of all, is the miracle of the infant that fell from its cradle. The nursemaid, seated at the left, arms extended, is evidently at the limit of pushing the cradle, suspended from two rings in the ceiling. The gesture of pushing combines with a gesture of horror and disbelief. One of the suspension cords has snapped, the frame of the cradle has collapsed, and the child has fallen from it head first. In the remainder of the scene, Simone has used the architectural setting to establish a lucid sequence of events. One woman, framed by an archway, prays to Agostino Novello for his aid, while another tends the injured infant. A staircase, the device we saw Duccio using in the Maya Star, leads us down through space and time to the street below, where the women, now dressed in street-going clothes, set off for Agostino's shrine with the infant. These later parts of the story give a clear sequence, but no precise sense of measurable time. This is what makes the broken cord of the infant's cradle in the upper part of the scene so striking. The sinuous curve of the snapped cord confirms that this is the instant when it's been released from tension. A moment later, and the cord will hang limp. A moment sooner, and the cord would have been stretched tight like that to the left, and the swaddled infant would still have been lying quietly in its cradle, swinging gently towards the right. Here, Simone has captured a precise moment in time. The viewer is engaged by the oscillation between present and immediate past, between the moment of disaster and the moment of safety before that, unseen, but nonetheless powerfully present in the mind's eye. The image of the broken cord is crucial in two ways to what I want to propose this evening. First, as I've already mentioned, I want to draw attention to ways in which the representation of time can contribute to the veracity of a painted narrative. Architectural settings, especially those interpreted as precursors of single point perspective, are routinely cited as the key means by which the illusion of reality was created by artists in Trecento, Italy. Often cited as well is the role that paintings of the lives of recent local saints, especially St. Francis, had to play in this phenomenon. <coughs> in the upper church at Assisi, painters were required to depict a version of local settings for events set just within living memory. So too, in the Agostino Novello panel, Miracles take place in the streets and dwellings of Siena and the surrounding countryside. The images do not appear to strive for complete accuracy, but setting and costume clearly refer to contemporary life, to the present. I propose that this specificity also affected Simone's use of time as a narrative tool. His miracle scene is placed in the here and in the now, this does not imply a rigidly realistic representation of time, just as the evocation of a Sienese street scene or a bedchamber is only selectively true to life, with the bound chests and tartan coverlets sufficiently setting up the impression of a domestic interior, so too representations of time are flexible. The momentary, the sequential, the simultaneous and the eternal can all be used even in one and the same scene to convey a story. Just as a variety of methods might be implied, employed to conjure up the illusion of an interior or a landscape or seascape, narrative devices related to time are not, in these works of the Trecento, rigidly consistent and logical. At this heady moment of artistic inventiveness and experiment, time, like space, lighting and costume, was an implement in the artist's toolkit. 
These visual devices were not unfailingly true to life. Veracity was to be found most potently in the experience of the viewer. This topic, the experience of the viewer, brings me to the second proposal I want to advance this evening. A cornerstone of the study of medieval vision and visuality is the concept of the three categories of vision set down by St. Augustine, corporeal, spiritual and intellectual. These were articulated by the 13th century as the bodily eye, the mind's eye and the imprinting of God in the soul. The mind's eye, or the eyes of the heart, the eyes of faith and so on, are often discussed both in medieval texts and modern scholarship. Seeing the corporeal world was regarded as inferior to what was seen by the eye of the mind, and both were entirely outshone by inner union with God. Nevertheless, as the Dominican friar Giordano da Pisa suggests in a sermon of 1305, corporeal viewing of a work of art can act as a valid first step in the journey to union with God. Preaching before a crucifix, Giordano says, if you gaze at it only with bodily eyes, you will not be healed. Or even if you look at it with the mind's eye, this still will not heal you. But do you want to be free and saved? Yes? You must gaze so that you have within you some likeness of him. Otherwise, your looking is not looking. In Giordano's version, the stages are progressive. Only by turning away from the physical object and locking up the external senses can the eye of the mind be activated. But perhaps the physical image can be more closely in dialogue with the mind's eye, trigger triggering a distinctive engagement between viewer and image. The implied event comes to life in the mind, Judas hastening away from the Last Supper, the boy hitting the ground, the moment of security before the cord of the cradle breaks. The last section of this lecture concerns anticipation. <coughs> anticipation has long been an aspect of a viewer's engagement with a work of art. Within the medieval church, there were many opportunities to experience this state. During Lent, for example, many images were covered only to be revealed again on Good Friday. Other rituals of veiling and unveiling were observed at Easter time. Griffith Mann has shown that in the principal church of San Gimignano, the Collegiata, during Holy Week, the figure of Christ in the large-scale fresco of the crucifixion was covered by a hanging as indicated by metal brackets above the cross arms. This image and the other crucifixes in, within the church, which were all also veiled, were all revealed simultaneously on Good Friday as the clergy sang the antiphon Ecce Lignum, Behold the Wood. Before the unveiling, the clergy sitting in the choir below the fresco and members of the laity to the west would presumably recall what the frescoed Christ looked like. As the days of Holy Week proceeded, anticipation of seeing the image again would have grown. How would the remembered image, seen in the mind's eye, compare with the experience of having the painted Christ revealed? In truth, we have no way of knowing, but we can speculate that the impact was considerable. Sorry. The revelation of images through removing Lenten covers was an annual occurrence, viewed in a public space as a strictly choreographed event. Other forms of visual anticipation could be more swiftly and frequently gratified. The owners of small-scale diptychs and triptychs could open them at will for private devotions or liturgical celebration. As the devotee reached forward to open the doors, he or she might see in their mind the image about to be corporeally revealed. In the example of the National Gallery triptych attributed to Duccio, the importance of this moment is underscored, as Dillian Gordon has shown, by the inscription held by Jacob on the gable, legible for the discerning owner, and perhaps giving him pause before proceeding with the act of revelation. This is the house of God and the gate of heaven. Thus, in Gordon's words, the triptych represents the house of God with the wings opening to reveal heaven. 
Heaven, in this case, is a view of the Virgin and Child. At first sight, the pair appear to be looking into one another's eyes, as in so many Parisian and other North European sculptures and images. But on closer inspection, it can be seen that the white of the Virgin's eye is showing below the iris, raising the pupil so that the angle of vision is subtly lifted above and away from the eye line of the child. He looks directly at his mother, pulling on her veil to catch her attention, but she is not focusing on him. Rather, she looks beyond the picture frame. Her solemn or perhaps sorrowful expression gives us the clue. Duccio is presenting the viewer with a very restrained version of the Byzantine image of the proleptic virgin, she who foresees and grieves for the future suffering of her infant. In the famous double-sided icon from Castoria in northern Greek, Greece, the object of the virgin's sorrow is depicted on the reverse of the panel. Her agitated grief, encountered on one side of the painting, is explained by walking around the icon, or seeing it turned, to reveal Christ as the man of sorrows. In the later 13th century, the man of sorrows was adopted into some Italian diptychs. And this 14th century Sienese example in the Horn Museum, now often attributed to Simone Martini, exploits the conjunction and the viewing angle provided by the diptych form by showing the Virgin in the left wing looking beyond her child to the man of sorrows in the right wing. Unlike these examples, Duccio's Virgin apparently lacks an accompanying image of the suffering Christ, but her proleptic gaze calls to the mind of the practised viewer the sorrow that she anticipates. Thus, the image of the Virgin's anticipation is overlaid for the viewer with their own knowledge of images of the Passion. Their anticipation is shared with hers as they see in their mind's eye future events. I'm going to suggest one more possible example of engaging the viewer through anticipation. This one is very speculative, but I couldn't resist including it. As some of you may know, I've been interested for some years in images of the Virgin's foot. <laughs> and this also turns out to be relevant to the theme of anticipation. Duccio's great panel of the Virgin and Child from Santa Maria Novella, the so-called Rucciolai Madonna, commissioned in 1285, is one of the three images of the Virgin that have long dominated the largest of the Sale dei Primitivi of the Uffizi. The Virgin's right foot, encased in an elaborately embroidered slipper, is extended towards the viewer, inviting what Hans Belting memorably described as ein symbolisches Fuscus, a symbolic kiss. Hence, I've argued, the viewer was invited to engage imaginatively with the image, envisaging a devotional touching and kissing that might be paid in reality to more accessible painting, sculpture, ivory, or other artwork. Facing the Ruchlai Madonna on the other side of the room is the Virgin and Child from Santa Trinita, universally attributed to Cimabue. It was painted close in time to Duccio's work, although which work came first is a matter of debate, in both works, the Virgin looks out of the painting directly into the onlooker's eyes. Wherever you stand in that gallery, the Virgin's gaze is inescapable. In Cimabue's image, the Christ child also looks directly at the viewers, rewarding them with a gesture of blessing, which the Virgin indicates with her hand. But Duce's Christ child is not similarly engaged. He extends his hand in blessing, but his gesture and his gaze are not directed at us. Instead, he turns his attention towards his right. Where is he looking? I've often wondered what he's looking at, and several possible answers come to mind. But standing between these two great panels during an MA study trip a year or two ago, it struck me that it might be just as interesting to ask what he's not looking at. And what he's very definitely not looking at is us, the viewers. The members of the lay confraternity dedicated to singing the praises of the Virgin who commissioned this work would surely have yearned for his blessing. So too would the Dominican friars of Santa Maria Novella. Every evening at Compline, they processed in the presence of this painting and probably often watched by the confraternity members 
and sang the hymn Salve Regina. As they came to the following words, they knelt before the Virgin, declaring, Turn then, our advocate, advocate, your eyes of mercy towards us, and after this, our exile, show us the blessed fruit of your womb, Jesus. For the friars and the confraternity members, intercession was a two-step process. First, the Virgin was entreated. If she was willing to intercede, the Christ child might turn to them as well. In Duccio's great painting, the Virgin's foot provides the focal point of ent for entreaty. Her eyes of mercy have turned towards the supplicants, but the gaze and blessing of her child have yet to be engaged. Christ's capacity to bless and thus to grant salvation are visible here. At this very moment, someone else is receiving this grace. Here, I would suggest, is the keen sense of engagement through anticipation. In the mind's eye, the child turns and bestows his attention and blessing. The viewer is caught between present and future, between the attainment of the Virgin's attention and intercession and the longed-for consequent result. When I first submitted my work on the Virgin's foot for publication, a reviewer objected that it was too long an article to devote to the consideration of a minor and marginal part of the image. That criticism brought home to me that I needed to articulate more clearly a key point. To the present day eye, especially one used to encountering the rich lie Madonna as an illustration in a book, her foot might indeed seem minor and marginal. But to a 13th century viewer, familiar with the action of homage to the feet of the powerful and encountering the Virgin's foot close to their own eye level, this part of the picture, far from being marginal, constituted a major point of initial engagement and entry into the painting. So, can the devices used in these works still connect with viewers across a temporal gap of over seven centuries? Can we still engage with Sienese paintings through time? Despite the great skills of Sienese artists in manipulating the onlooker's response, a present-day viewer might experience an engagement with an image that is strong, but non-historical or ahistorical, what might be called a broken engagement, plenty of feeling, but also misunderstandings. To take just one example, let's remain with the always fascinating theme of the Virgin's foot. People writing about the kneeling Franciscans in Duccio's Madonna dei Francescani often assume that what we're seeing is a kind of chronophotograph or a 13th century precursor to Duchamp's new descending a staircase. The friar's superimposed bodies are said to, quote, suggest the sequence of a single continuous action of genuflection. This is the response of a period eye formed with a familiarity with 20th century painting and freeze frame photography. But a 13th century viewer would have had other reference points in mind. The Magi, adoring the feet of the Christ child, invariably consisted of kings of three ages, young, middle-aged, and old. And just as invariably, it was the oldest, grey-haired, bearded Magus who was the first to kneel, kiss, Christ, kiss Christ's foot, and receive his blessing. Getting very close up to Duccio's tiny painting, it's possible to discern that the three kneeling Franciscans are of three distinct ages. Since these friars are tonsured and clean-shaven, this cannot be shown through their hair and beard. But the face of the lowest Franciscan is undoubtedly the chubbiest, while that of the uppermost friar is the most drawn. What we're seeing is not three stages of descent towards the goal of kissing the Virgin's foot, but three stages in the ascent towards receiving Christ's longed-for blessing and promise of salvation. A core message of the painting concerns the sequence of supplication, supplication. First, one must beg at her feet for the Virgin's intercession. If granted, one may rise in hope, and the confirmation of the desired outcome is the upright pose of the uppermost, oldest, most senior friar, 
who having been the first of these three Franciscans to pass through these stages, looks up, like the oldest of the three Magi, to receive the Christ child's blessing and to communicate with him directly. In other words, what the youngest friar can only anticipate, the oldest friar has already received. The artist's use of time, be it anticipation, sequence, or simultaneity, can all help to draw in the 21st century viewer. Sometimes these devices connect with us directly. At other times, as we've just seen, a little extra guidance is required. And there are, of course, other ways to engage with these works. We can visit them in grand galleries, discussing them with colleagues and students. Sometimes we can handle them, thanks to the generosity of curators, and consider their materials and making. We can scrutinize them with the help of visual aids, looking at or beneath the surface. Or, that perennial court old favorite, pay close attention to the back of a work. <laughs> and we can look beyond our immediate circle of students and colleagues to consider how to draw new viewers into an engagement with the art of medieval Siena. The unexpected acquisition by the Ferens Gallery in Hull of a previously unknown work by Pietro Lorenzetti coincided with the nomination of Hull as UK City of Culture 2017. The imaginative collaboration between the curators at Hull and at the National Gallery led to a loan exhibition to put the new work in context and plenty of hands-on experience of involving a new generation with the art of Trecento Italy. At the Courtauld, I organized a workshop called Engaging with the Trecento to celebrate the inspiring work of Kirsten Simister, Caroline Campbell, <coughs> and their teams. I'm going to end this lecture with one more bit of anticipation. Caroline Campbell and I have for some time been working on plans to mount an exhibition of Sienese art from before 1400. As these plans have grown in scope and ambition, we've been joined by Stefan Volohojan of the Metropolitan Museum as co-curators in laying the foundations for a two-centre show in London and New York, drawing on the strengths of our respective institutions. The exhibition has already lived for some time in my mind's eye, frequently changing shape as plans evolve. Many elements are perforce still undecided, but some of the main lines seem clear. It will be an exhibition that presents panel paintings with works in other media. It will, show, it will be a show that emphasizes the international <coughs> connections, inspirations and reverberations of such a locally distinctive artistic language. And it will be a show that celebrates the work of Sienese painters, sculptors and goldsmiths as one of the crowning achievements of later medieval European art, while also acknowledging it as a source of much that is great about European art of the 15th century, both north and south of the Alps. I hope that it will be a show that excites and enriches those who already know these works, stimulates new ideas, and captures the attention and enthusiasm of those so far unf unfamiliar with the achievements of Sienese artists of the 13th and 14th centuries. I look forward keenly to continuing preparations for the show, and in particular to studying works and developing ideas with colleagues, be they co-curators, close colleagues, current and former students, respected scholars in the field, or other people I have yet to meet. Most of all, I look forward to continuing my engagement with Sienese art, about which there is still so much to explore. Thank you.